keeping students safe from ideas that they don't like, that ideas that they find offensive, that is totalitarian science at this point. I'm gonna say it. This beautiful letter um, that came out uh, in the Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters, and I think um, if it were me and I had students, um, for the record, I don't have students that I'm mentoring right now, but if I had students, I would be having them read this letter um, because it makes a very, very good point. Um, and, and for me, it ties back to a lot of the things I've said on this channel about the difference between science and wisdom and a whole bunch of uh, things related to that and the problems that happen when ideology gets into science or ideolo ideologies try to control science, um, whether it be political right or political left, it's a bad thing. Um, but this comes from Professor Anna Krylov, um, who wrote this absolutely beautiful letter, um, warning about the dangers of ideological control being being included in uh, in science. And so I thought it would be interesting to read through some of the points of this letter that I thought were really, really interesting um, as some of my own commentary, but I encourage you to go read it. It's actually very short. It's only, um, uh, well, six pages total, but I think the, the last whole page is just references that she has in here. So um, feel free to, you know, you don't need to read all the references unless you're really crazy like I am. Um, here. <laughs> But um, uh, Professor Krylov grew up in the Soviet Union. She grew up with that whole mess where ideology of the government was controlling everything. And it, and it makes for an absolute mess, to be honest, when you're, uh, when you're dealing with this kind of stuff. And so I, I thought it would be interesting in her in her commentary to see some of her commentary here and to talk about some of that and what it was like. And, you know... My thoughts on that as we go forward in science is really interesting um, here. So, let's see. I grew up in a city that that in its short history, barely over 150 years, had changed its name, had its names changed three times. Founded in 1869 around a steel plant and coal mines built by the Welsh industrialist John Hughes, the settlement was originally called Hugo. Uh, Hugo I'm going to butcher the Russian. Hugo uh, Hugosovska. Hugosovska. I'm going to butcher it. When the Bolsheviks came to power in, 19, in the 1917 revolution, the new government of the working class, the Soviets, set out to purge the country of ideologically impure influences in the name of the proletariat and the worldwide struggle of the suppressed masses. Cities and geographic landmarks were renamed, statues were torn down, books were burned, and millions were jailed and murdered. In due course, the commissars got to Yuzovka, uh, which is the other name, of this town, um, and the city was stripped of the name of its founder and representative of the hostile class of oppressors and a Westerner. In modern terms, Hughes was canceled. For a few months, the city was called Trotsky, Trotsk, after Leon Trotsky, until Trotsky himself lost a power struggle inside the city and uh, inside the party and was himself canceled. In 1924, became the namesake of the new supreme leader of the Communist Party, Stalin, and a few years later, renamed to Stalino. My mother's school certificates have Stalino on them. Following Stalin's death in 1953, the Communist Party underwent some reckoning and admitted that several decades of terror and many millions of murdered citizens were somewhat excessive. Stalin was canceled. His body was removed from the mausoleum at Red Square, where it had been displayed next to Lenin's. Textbooks and encyclopedias were written once again, and cities institutions and landmarks bearing his name were promptly renamed. Stalino became Donetsk after the river Sever 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 Donetsk. Again, I'm going to butcher the Russian. I apologize. I came of age during a relatively mellow period of Soviet rule post-Stalin. Still, the ideology permeated all aspects of life, and survival required strict adherence to the party line and enthusiastic displays of ideologically proper behavior. Not joining a young communist organization, Com, um, Com Small, no, Com, whatever, would be career suicide. Non-members were barred from higher education. I apologize. I can't pronounce the Russian. <laughs> Uh, would be career suicide. Non-members were barred from higher education. Openly practicing religion could lead to more grim consequences. 
up to imprisonment. So could reading the wrong book, Orwell, Solzhenitsky, uh, etc. Even a poetry book that was not state on the state-approved list could get one in trouble. Mere compliance was not sufficient. The, ideolo ideological com the ideology committees were constantly on the lookout for individuals whose support of the regime was not sufficiently enthusiastic. It was not uncommon to get disciplined for being too quiet during mandatory political assemblies, politi information, that's not right. Um, yeah, I'm not going to pronounce it. Or for showing up late to mandatory mass celebrations, such as the May or June November demonstrations. Once I got a notice for promoting an imperialistic agenda by showing up in jeans for an informal school event. A friend's dossier was permanently blemished, making him ineligible for PhD programs for not fully participating in a trip required of university students, an act of voluntary help to comrades in collective farms. Science was not spared from this strict ideological control. Western influences were considered to be dangerous. Textbooks and scientific papers tirelessly emphasized the priority and preeminence of Russian and Soviet science. Entire disciplines were declared ideologically impure, reactionary, and hostile to the causes of the working class dominance and the world revolution. Notable examples of bourgeois pseudoscience included genetics and cyber cybernetics. So if you remember what I was saying about oh, wait, quantum mechanics and general relativity were also criticized for insufficient alignment with dialectic materialism. Okay. Genetics here, she's making a point. That's the story of Trofim Lysenko right there. Um, up until Stalin. I mean, she was there after Stalin's desk, but that was one of the things. Lysenko rejected um, Mendelian genetics, which had been established at that point for about 100 years by the time of Stalin. Um, and as such, his preferred view of genetics was what Stalin preferred, and a lot of scientists were butchered because they didn't agree with Lysenko. Um, and the result was a huge amount of famine in the Soviet Union, along with the deaths of many esteemed scientists who just didn't tow the ideology. And rather, what they were trying to engage in the process of science and finding the truth, rather than serving an ideology. Most relevant to chem chemistry was the in yeah. This is a chemistry letter, and she's a, I believe it, she is a chemist, Dr. Krylov. Um, so, but she's she's making a seriously important point in this, in that if you didn't serve the ideology at the time in the Soviet Union. Um, even if you were a scientist and you didn't serve the ideology that was there, you were persona non grata, you were canceled in this, as we talk about in this current time, um, and what have you. Um, you know, and you, you know, you lost out on job opportunities. You lost out on, you lost out on the ability to do more in your education. You lost out on so many different things. And up to the point that you were imprisoned or killed if you didn't toe the party line. Um, and if you didn't, express the proper support of all the things that were approved of. Now, this is, this is important to keep this in mind because this kind of shit does happen in history where scientists get stuck dealing with ideology. And she goes on with that. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to go here too much. And there's other points that she wants to make, and I don't want to read this whole article to you because it is long. Um, well, not long. It is six pages. It's not as long as other things, but... Let's see. So she's talking in this paragraph about the idea of resonance. Um, and there was a campaign in chemistry in Russia that, you know, you can't have um, anti-resonance. It was deemed to be, you can't have resonance. It was deemed to be bourgeois pseudoscience in um, the Soviet Union because it didn't support the ideology that was desired by the Russians. It was, came from the West. Therefore, it was evil kind of thing um, here. And it supported Western ideology. So therefore, no, you can't do that science. Do you see the problem with that when you give the government, when the government takes hold of what can and cannot be studied, what can and cannot be said, what you must and must not believe? There's all sorts of horrific, nasty things that happen. It happens in history a lot of the time, and it did affect science, too, very much so. Um, science should not ever be limited by what the government wants people to say, or even what society at large wants people to say and think. Um, you know, societal norms should not necessarily limit what questions science can ask, or not, not questions what science can ask, but uh, what questions a scientist can ask, or what research a scientist can explore, with the exception of, of course, there's very certain things, like the science that led to the eugenics programs, my god, no, don't do that again, kind of thing, right? There are some things there that, of course, should never be done, but in terms of things like anti-resonance in physics, and chemistry, and meteorology, and climate science, nothing um, that the government 
says really sh nothing that the government should not be telling what is good science and what is bad science, what is good knowledge and what is bad knowledge in this. This is why I got a I got a problem too with fact checkers that exist out there because you're going like authoritative sources. Okay, question: How do you know the authoritative source has the truth? A. How do you know they're not lying to you? B. Um, how do you know they're not biased? C. Those authoritative sources. And, see, and who the hell gives them the license to say what is the truth and what is not? Um, this, is, this is fun philosophical questions, but this is why I get nervous at the idea of fact checkers fact checking everything like on Facebook and YouTube and what have you. And goodness knows they're not necessarily the best idea, I don't think, because it comes naturally to this next thing of what you can and cannot say. Because it's not approved by the authoritative sources, right? <clears throat> it is something I worry about. So let's see. By the time I studied quantum chemistry at Moscow State University, resonance theory had been rehabilitated. Yet, the history of the campaign and the injustices it entailed were not discussed in the open. The party did not welcome conversations about its past mistakes. I remember hearing parts of the story narrated under someone's breath at a party after copious amounts of alcohol had loosened a tongue. Fast forward to 2021, another century. The Cold War is a distant memory, and the country shown on my birth certificate, school university, and university diploma, as the USSR, is no longer on the map. But I find myself experiencing its legacy some thousands of miles to the west, as if living in an Orwellian twilight zone. I witness ever-increasing attempts to subject science and education to ideological control and censorship. Just as in Soviet times, the censorship is being justified by the greater good. Whereas in 1950, the greater good was advancing the world revolution in the USSR. In the US, the greater good was fighting communism, the government thing there. In 2021, the greater good is social justice. The capitalization is important. With is a specific, Social justice is a specific ideology with goals that have little in common with what lowercase social justice means in plain English. As in the USSR, the censorship is enthusiastically imposed also from the bottom, by various by members of the scientific community whose motives vary from naive idealism to cynical power grabbing. Just as during the time of the Great Terror, dangerous conspiracies and plots against the world revolution were seen everywhere, from illustrations in children's books to hairstyles and fashions. Today we are told that racism, patriarchy, misogyny, and other reprehensible ideas are encoded in scientific terms, names of equations, and in plain English words. We are told that in order to build a better world to address social inequalities, we need to purge our literature of these names of people whose personal records are not up to the high standards of the self-anointed bearers of the new truth, the elect. We are told that we need to rewrite our syllabi and change the way we teach and speak. As an example of political censorship and cancel culture, consider a recent viewpoint discussing the centuries-old tradition of attaching names to scientific concepts and discoveries, Archimedes' principle, Newton's law of motion, Schrodinger's equation, Curie law, etc. The authors call for vigilance in naming discoveries that, and assert that, quote, Basing the name with inclusive priorities may provide a path to a richer, deeper, more robust understanding of the science and its advancement. Really, on what grounds is this based? History, history teaches us the opposite. The outcomes of, a merit, of the merit-based liberal pluralistic societies are vastly superior to those of the ideologically controlled science of the USSR and other totalitarian regimes. This is the thing that I worry about with the nonsense of critical race theory, with anti-racism and all of that getting into science. Really? What? What? And, and, that, and that's the thing is, you know, she, she, she's making the point. Professor Krylov is making the point here quite well that if you're more focused on, if you're focused on this inclus on inclusivity kind of thing, and yes, don't get me wrong, I've said it before many millions of times. I'm all for the diversity and what have you and everything in there. But really, how does it help improve science? The outcomes of a merit-based science of liberal pluralistic societies are vastly superior to those of the ideologically controlled science of the USSR and other totalitarian regimes. The authors call for removing the names of people who, quote, cross the line of moral and ethical standards. Examples include Fritz Haber, Peter Debbie, and William Shockley, but the list could be extended to include Stark, defended expulsion of the Jews from German institutions, Heisenberg led Germany's nuclear weapons program, and Schrodinger had romantic relationships with underage girls. 
Indeed, learned societies are now devoting considerable effort to renaming to such renaming campaigns. Among most recent cancellations is the renaming of the Fisher Prize by the Evolution Society, despite well argued argued opposition from ten past presidents and vice presidents of the society. There is no doubt that many famous scientists had views or engaged in behaviors that, by today's standards, are not acceptable. Their scientific legacies are often mixed. For example, Fritz Haber is both the father of modern chemical warfare and the man whose development of nitrogen fixation is feeding the planet. Yes, nitrogen fixation was a huge deal to actually be able to have fertilizer and grow crops in places where it otherwise would be impossible to do so. Scientists are not saints. Very true. As I have said many times here, you know, scientists, science and wisdom. There's a difference between science and wisdom in here. Hmm. There's a big difference between science and wisdom going on um, with all these things. And that's the thing. Scientists are absolutely not saints here and should not be assumed so. We don't get our moral compass from doing science and nobody should presume what we do. They are human beings born into places and times they did not choose. Just as their fellow human beings do, each finds his or her way through the circumstances of their lives, such as totalitarian regimes, world wars, and revolutions. Sometimes they made the right choices, sometimes they erred. Some paid dearly for their mistakes. Haber was an avid German patriot to the extent that he actively developed chemical weapons in order to provide Germany with a military advantage. Yet his motherland rejected him because he was a Jew. He was barely able to escape Germany, and part of his extended family perished in the concentration camps. As eloquently stated by Stern in his essay, are we really morally superior that we can, quote, judge a life by one disastrous deformation, which in some ways epitomized his and his country's worst faults? That is a brilliant quote right there. Think about it carefully, because it's like, are you really going to judge an entire life by something terrible. Because this is what cancel culture does. Cancel culture goes after people for something stupid that they said. That they shouldn't have said. And you're not giving them forgiveness for it. And they're otherwise probably a very good person. Um, the other thing. just like, If you're going to. Yes. Founders of this country did some horrible things. And a lot of them were outright racist. But that doesn't necessarily get rid of all the good things that they did. Leading up to this point in history. All the good things like the constitution. Being for a good example. A good example of something really good. So, no, you don't necessarily cancel them just because of one bad, one bad thing in their time of life where they were and what point of history that they were in. Soviet history is full of examples of patriotic scientists who were imprisoned and murdered by the regime while proclaiming their unconditional loyalty to the world revolution. One such tragic figure was Hans Hellmann, who fled Germany in 1933 because of his Jewish wife, and despite multiple warnings, came to Russia because he believed in the socialist ideals, only to be executed by the Soviet regime as in any of the people in 1938. Some famous scientists were brave dissidents, and some were conformists and opportunists. Should we judge their scientific con contributions by their political standing, the extent to which they collaborated with repressive regimes, or how wholesome their personal lives were? The authors of the viewpoint go as far as to suggest that we should use the names of scientific discoveries and institutions as a vehicle to promote ideology, that is, as a propaganda tool, as was done by the Soviet, Nazi, and Maoist regimes. The intersection of science, morality, and ideology has been studied by many scholars and historians. Historians... History provides ample evidence that totalitarian censorship of scientists, science is harmful to progress and the well-being of societies. Merton's norms of science provide a clear separation between science and morality. Particularly relevant is Merton's principle of universality, which states that claims to truth are evaluated in terms of universal or impersonal criteria, not on the basis of race, class, gender, religion, or nationality. Let me put it to you, let me say it to you again. Particularly relevant is Merton's principle of universality, which states that claims to truth are evaluated in terms of universal or impersonal criteria, not on the basis of the race, gender, religion, or nationality. Simply put, we should evaluate, reward, and acknowledge scientific contributions strictly on the base of intellectual merit and not on the basis of personal traits of the scientist or a current political agenda. That is the thing that I would love to see stay in science, and I am terrified that it is getting thrown out. That is what 
freaking concerns me because the more of this crap with critical race theory and what have you gets into science, and that's what she goes into. She talks about it more later. But she gets into that where she talks about the problem with this stupid moralization that we're getting into right now is that we're trying, we're getting to the point where we're going to reward things on race, just gender. We're going to start considering people's peer-reviewed work on the basis of race, class, gender, what have you. That's what I'm afraid of. That's what I'm honestly afraid of. And that's not important in all of this. It's absolutely unimportant. I'm, I, you know what I'm for? Just like If you're evaluating a paper, doing peer review in a paper, I would love to see like a mandatory triple-line peer review where you cannot know who the author is, where you don't know who the reviewers are, where you don't even know who the editor is. And let it be done that way. Um, that would make a hell of a lot more sense to me than, 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 the non- than some of the nonsense that we have. But um, conversations about the history of science and the complexity of its social and ethical aspects can enrich our lives and should be a welcome addition to science curricula. The history of science can teach us to appreciate the complexity of the world and humanity. It can also help us to navigate urgent contemporary issues. Censorship and cancellation will not make us smarter. It will not lead to better science and will not help the next generation of scientists to make better choices. Exactly. I think of, I think of the notions like... Well, let me go on. Let me go on a little bit here and see. Um... The authors acknowledge the historical complexities. Da, 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 da. She talks in this section about um, a guy who made a scientist who made some really significant um, things, really significant um, advances in science, and um, as a result, you know, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> One of the Mertonian principles of science is the idea of organized skepticism Um, in here, which I think, is it? Yeah, organized skepticism. Scientific claims should be exposed to critical scrutiny before being accepted both in methodology and institutional codes of conduct. So here's the thing. She's talking about a particular case. Shockley um, was a scientist who did some pretty damn horrible things. He had some very, very abhorrent views um, that were outside of his expertise on race and gender and what have you. Um, and I forget exactly what it was. I know she goes into it in here in particular, but I think he, I think if I remember correctly, Shockley was a hugely sexist guy, thought women shouldn't be involved in all those kind of stuff. Thought, thought African-Americans couldn't do, uh, couldn't do science work shit. He was a jackass. Um, true. But let's see. Um, note that in the case of Pauling and Shockley, the Mertonian principle of organized skepticism has already been taken care of effectively separating the wheat from the chaff. While Shockley's detailed balance paper, reference 11, is cited almost 7,000 times, his paper on race... Oh, that's right. He was the one who wrote the paper on race and IQ. He argued that... He argued in that paper that um, the white race had higher IQ than other races. Um, Again, his words, not mine. Shockley is a jackass um, for that particular paper, but this paper was good. It's cited 7,000 times, but this particular other paper that he had on race and IQ, 15 citations. Um, digging deeper into the Shockley case, many of his biographers attribute his well-demented, well-documented antisocial traits and behaviors, social withdrawal and paranoia, to a mental disorder that described him as a highly high-functioning autist. So he was, the guy was autistic. In the in his book, The Gene, McCary uses Shockley to illustrate the ethical conundrums of gene editing by pointing out that the same combination of genes can be both genius-enabling and disease-enabling. What if Shockley's deplorable views were the result of his mental disorder? Should we cancel him anyway? Think about that carefully, you know. Um, I think we should discuss his mixed legacy and learn from his complicated story the same way we can learn about Fritz Haber and others. These stories can teach us about the complexity of the world and of human minds and the importance of tolerance and empathy. Should we leave, and we should leave Shockley, Quasier Limit, and the other named discoveries and equations alone. The issue of science and moralization is older than 20th century regimes. For example, Giordano Bruno was canceled, burned at the stake in 1600, because his cosmological views were considered to be a great threat to the dominant ideology. The guardians of the truth, his prosecutors, quote, had the desire to serve freedom and promote the common good. Uh, Self-censorship in Marie Curie. In 1911, Marie Curie was ostracized there for immoral behavior and affair with a married man following the tragic death of her husband, Pierre Curie. 
the chair of the Nobel Prize Committee, Svante Arrhenius, uh, wrote and advi- wrote to advise her that she not attend the official ceremony for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in view of her questionable moral standing. Curie replied that she would be present at the ceremony because, typo, uh, the pr- quote, the prize has been given to her for the, her discovery of polonium and radium, end quote, and that, quote, there is no relation between her scientific work and the facts of her private life. Today, we regard this attempt to cancel Curie on the grounds of her morally, moral impurity as utterly absurd, yet we continue to witness the intrusion of moral arguments into the scientific domain. There's a lot of times in history where we've had this happen, where ideology has invaded its way into science. Um, and this is, again, why I'm screaming from the rooftops that this is a bad idea to have this kind of notion of critical race theory and s- some of the social justice, capital social justice ideology invade in science. And that's actually where um, she gets into in here. Today's censorship does not stop at purging the vocabulary of scientists who cross the line or fail the ideological litmus tests of the elect. And the elect are the people doing all the, a lot of the capital social justice stuff in this view. In some schools, physics classes no longer teach Newton's laws, but the three fundamental laws of physics. Why was Newton canceled? Because he was white. And the new ideology calls for decentering, decentering whiteness and decolonizing the curriculum. A comment in Nature calls for replacing the accepted technical term quantum supremacy by quantum advantage. The authors regard the English word supremacy as, quote, violent and equate its usage with promoting racism and colonialism. They also warn about damage inflicted by using such terms as conquest. I assume divide and conquer will have to go too. See, she's making a good point here at the end of this. A lot of this stuff about changing words, that is exactly what the Soviet Union did. That is exactly what Mao's China did. And what China still continues to do under the Chinese Communist Party. They still continue to do that. Um, And all sorts of different things. You know? Um, let me finish the rest of this par- rest of this paragraph because this is such a great section. I assume divide and conquer will have to go too. Remarkably, the Soviet style ghost cha- chasing gains traction in partnership with their diversity, equity, and inclusion task force. The Information Technology Services of the Department of the University of Michigan set out to purge the language within the university by imposing restrictions on university vendors. Oh, and without from such hurtful and racist terms as picnic. Brown bag lunch, black and white thinking, master password, dummy variable, disabled system, grandfathered account, straw man argument, and long time no see. This list is not exhaustive and will continue to grow, warns the memo. Indeed, new words are canceled every day. I just learned the word normal will no longer appear on Dove Soap packaging because it makes people, it makes most people feel excluded. Emphasis her own there. Again, this is stupid. That's why I'm, I... This kind of censorship is utterly stupid. And I'm not going to stop. I mean, what? I got told the other day that apparently saying stakeholder about somebody is offensive. That I I still have no understanding of why that is. And I'm I'm not even going to pretend to understand why. And I'm not going to change my language all the time just to satisfy one person um, necessarily here. I'm not going to do that. Do words have life and power of their own? Can they really cause injury? Do they carry hidden messages? The ideology claims so and encourages us all to be on the constant lookout for offensive. Okay. This goes back. She's she's getting at it without saying it. It goes back to critical theory, to critical social justice, critical race theory. Critical race theory in particular says racism is everywhere. Racism is endemic to society. Therefore, look for it everywhere is what happens. Um, and your answer, your job is to root it out if you're an advocate of that ideology. Your job is to root out racism everywhere. This is the thing that she's talking about. It's just like a lot of these words, like I'm presuming master password is, is one that would be getting, um, getting canceled here because it's, you know, you know, it's hearkening back to slave master or something like some godforsaken logic like that. Although that probably only came into existence in the last 30 years. Um, so no, I think that's stupid. That's not, uh, a, not a racially charged term in the slightest. If you're not sure when you should be offended, check out the list of microaggressions. A quick Google search can deliver plenty of official documents from serious institutions that with a few exceptions sound like a sketch for the next Borat movie. Ooh. 
If nothing it fits the bill, you can always find malice on the gr- in the sounds of foreign language. At the University of Southern California, a professor was recently suspended because students claimed to have been offended by the sounds of Chinese words used to illustrate the concept of filler words in a communication class. Why did I devote a considerable amount of time to writing this essay? After all, I'm no fan of Shockley. His eugenic views disgust me. Notwithstanding his monumental contributions to one of the most pressing problems we face, harnessing solar energy. Yes, Shockley actually uh, had a lot to do with solar panels. And are you, uh, but he was also a hell of a racist and a eugenicist. (laughs) At the same time, he was all for eugenics. So, you know, this is the point making. I would not want to sit next to him at a dinner party, yet the term Shockley Quasar limit elicits no emotional response from me, neither does Stark Effect, Haber Bosch Process, or Deb Units. To most scientists, these are convenient labels which remind us that the cathedrals of science are built by mere morals and not some deeply meaningful symbols of reverence. So, why should we not humor those who claim to feel differently and rename everything in sight? After all, renaming equations is easier than renaming cities, buildings, or landmarks. The answer is simple. Our future is at stake. As a community, we face an important choice. We can succumb to extreme left ideology and spend the rest of our lives ghost chasing and witch hunting, rewriting history, politicizing science, redefining elements of language, and turning STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, education, into a farce. Or we can hold, uphold a key principle of the democratic society, the free and uncensored exchange of ideas and continue our core mission, the pursuit of the truth, and focusing attention on real, important problems of humankind. That's where I'm at right now, with all this crap. The lessons of history are numerous and unambiguous. Despite vast natural and human resources, the USSR lost the Cold War, crumbled, and collapsed. Interestingly, even the leaders of the most repressive regimes were able to understand, to some extent, the weakness of totalitarian science. For example, in the midst of the great terror, Kapitsa and Yof were able to convince Stalin about the importance of physics to military and technological advantage to the extent that he reversed some arrests. For example, Falk and Landau were set free. However, an estimated 10% of physicists perished during this time. Yeah, Stalin wasn't a fan of physics. Um, in the late 40s, after nuclear physicists explained that without relativity theory there would be no nuclear bomb, Stalin ruled back the planned campaign against physics and instructed Beria to give physicists some space. This led to significant advancements in accomplishments by Soviet scientists in several domains. However, neither Stalin nor subsequent Soviet leaders were able to let go of the controls completely. Government control out of science turned out to be a grand failure, and the attempts to patch the widening gap between the West and the East by espionage did not help. Today, Russia is hopelessly behind the West in both technology and quality of life. The book Totalitarian Science and Technology provides many more examples of such failed experiments. I gotta read that book, actually. That'd be very interesting. Today, STEM holds the key for sol- to solving problems far more important than the nuclear arms race. Reversing climate change, fighting global hunger and poverty, controlling pandemics and harnessing the power of new technologies, quantum computing, bioengineering, and renewable energy for the benefit of humanity. Normalizing the ideolog- ideological intrusion into science and abandoning Mertonian principles will cost us dearly. We cannot afford it. Professor Krylov is 100% right. I do not support, in the slightest, the ideology of decolonization, of doing all this stuff, of canceling everything that comes from, from Western culture just because of the ills of the past that happened then we don't like. I'm not a fan of slavery. I'm not a fan of what happened to the indi- indigenous um, peoples of um, the Native American tribal nations. I'm not a fan of all that. But that doesn't mean it's the right idea to go about and cancel everything, to put it under an ideological control just because you don't want to offend certain groups or certain people. You know? Keeping students safe from ideas that they don't like, that ideas that they find offensive, that is totalitarian science at this point. I'm going to say it. That gets right into being totalitarian nature science. And I'm not going to put up with it. I think it's a pretty damn piss poor idea. Sticking to Mertonian principles with science is a very good idea here. Organized skepticism, demanding evidence, careful scrutiny of everything. And the problem with a lot of the social justice related stuff right now invading itself in science is it does not allow strict scrutiny to happen. And it also, you know, says, hey, we gotta we got to consider more... It ignores the universalism thing, um, r- rating things on their intellectual merit rather than um, universalism is the idea that you want to 
look at claims based upon their intellectual merit, not on their, um, not on the race, sex, gender, or all the rest of the person who said it. Um, and the way the ideology is going right now, I am worried about it being the case that, you know, we're going to look at these things based upon who said it instead of what was said, you know. And the intellectual merit is something as opposed, uh, is more, far more important than who said it, what race they were, what ge gender they were, anything like that. I'm, of course I'm all for diversity in science. I do want more people from all backgrounds to come, to come into science. I'm all for it. But there should not be that becoming the ideologically controlling factor of science. I said it in my response to, my nat into the, uh, to the nature interview. I've said it a number of times. It will not help. And I, I, I find myself in complete agreement with this. It's like, scientists are human just as much as anyone else in their, in their times. You know, they make, they make errors. They make moral judgments that are, that are lousy. Does that mean everything good about them deserves to be thrown out too? And, you know, everything good that they did. I'll give you a modern day example. Michael Mann, climate scientist, um, created the famous hockey stick graphic. I appreciate it tremendously, uh, all the work that he's done. There's no doubt that some of his stuff was brilliant. I can't stand the man, actually, um, from what I've seen of him on Twitter. I can't stand the man, precisely because he's incredibly nasty to people who disagree with him. Um, or at least it appears that way. No, I can't, I can't stand the man. Um, but moreover, one of the things I would say to that is that, you know... He, he's, he's been in the news a few times for suing people who disagree in the slightest or say some little bad thing about him. And I think the last time he filed a lawsuit, the court in British Columbia threw it out and ordered that he pay the, uh, the legal fees of the defendant that he had sued because his case was so poor um, against the guy. So this is things like that. It's, that's why I can't stand Michael Mann. I don't follow him on Twitter because he he, he's very negative. From what I've seen of him, I don't. I don't think very much of him, um, as a person. Scientific contributions, he's great. Great scientific contributions that he's given, so far as I can tell. But that's a modern day example. Michael Mann should not be canceled just because of how much of a jerk he might be in his day to day life. Same for any other scientist in history. You don't cancel them. You don't get rid of them. You don't just make changes because they had they they happen to be white, you know. Um, and that's, where is it? Yeah, decentering whiteness and decolonizing the curriculum. That's the only reason is because he was a white person. You're ignoring the fact that he, Newton made incredible contributions to physics. That is rejecting universalism. Because he's white, you just stop talking about him. You don't give it his name or what have you. Um, and it's the same thing with, like, the, the variants of the COVID virus right now. What are we calling them? We're calling them Alpha, Beta, Delta, Gamma or something like that. Instead of where they originated out from. I thought this letter was wonderful. I I hope you go go read it um, because it was absolutely fantastic read. Um, and so I think that's it for now. If you like this content, please like, uh, like this video. Share, comment, subscribe to this channel. Uh, hit the notification bell, don't forget. Uh, if you want to interact more with me, you can head on over and become a supporter of SciWorthy.Locals.com, SciWorthy.Locals.com. Um, and that way you can get the uh, get the chance to interact with me and also with some other scientists that are over there as supporters of SciWorthy. Um, get some questions answered directly from the scientists themselves. Anyway, uh, that's it for now. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I uh, hope you all have a wonderful time. Um, that's it. Signing off. I'm Adrian. Stay curious, my friends.